So, ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome uh, to today's uh, lecture given by Dr. Net Annette Weber uh, as part of the Development Matters series uh, hosted by the Institute and sponsored by uh, Irish Aid. The, um, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Weber as the EU's Special Representative for the Horn of Africa. Uh, she'll speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will have, as usual, uh, a Q&A session, partly uh, questions from within the room and partly uh, online questions, uh, and uh, we will finish, roughly speaking, around two o'clock. Just some, some housekeeping points first. For those in the room, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand and we will uh, we will come to you with a roving mic. For those of you taking part online, you'll be able to to join uh, using the using the Q and A function on Zoom, which you will see on your screens. Um, today's presentation by Dr. Weber and also um, Q and A are on the record. Um, feel free to join the discussion on Twitter or X using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag uh, development matters. And we're also live streaming today's discussion. So a very warm welcome to those who will be following us on, on YouTube. Now to our, our guest speaker, Dr. Netta Weber was appointed as the EU special representative for the Horn of Africa in July, 2021. Uh, she is already uh, an outstanding expert on, on Africa going back over many years. Um, and she is particularly expert on the region, which she now covers, having had over 25 years of experience uh, with it and, and its challenges. She was engaged in mediation in Sudan and Ethiopia uh, as a senior advisor for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, uh, which is well known to us here. Um, from 2010 to 2012, you, you worked as a consultant uh, in residence in, uh, in uh, Addis. And uh, Dr. Weber has also lectured as a professor of conflict studies of international relations and of African international relations at various universities in, in Germany, Austria, and Spain. And uh, you've published extensively on peace and security issues uh, in, in various uh, peace and security issues in the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea area. Um, finally, I should say that earlier in your career, you were a senior fellow on Africa and the Middle East um, uh, at SWP, which we also know, the German Institute for Security and International Affairs. And you worked for a period with Amnesty International and with, um, I think, Human Rights Watch. That's a, a quick overview of your of your illustrious career. Dr. Weber, first, I'd like to ask Michael O'Toole um, to say a few words on behalf of Irish Aid to welcome you. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. I'm uh, Michael O'Toole. I'm the Africa Director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. I'm delighted to be here for this talk by uh, the European Union Special Representative for the Horn of Africa, Dr. Annette Weber. I'd first of all like to thank the IIEA for hosting this address as part of the Development Matters series um, sponsored by Irish Aid. Um, David, as you were saying, Dr. Weber has served as the USOR for the Horn of Africa since June 2021. And she's been extremely active across the range of complex and interlinked uh, challenges and crises affecting the Horn of Africa. Um, today's talk is very timely. Um, in the recent past, we've had the uh, conflict in northern uh, Ethiopia, followed by the cessation of hostilities agreement of November 2022. We've had the outbreak of a full scale conflict in Sudan since last April, and we have the ongoing security crisis in Somalia and uh, other linked challenges across the Horn, but all of this is taking place also against the backdrop of a severe drought and humanitarian emergency affecting almost everywhere in the Horn. And then of course, in the recent uh, weeks to add to this difficulty has been the crisis in Gaza and the resulting rising tensions in the Red Sea, which provides a frame for Dr. Weber's address today. So I think we're all very much looking forward to hearing how the EU and Ireland can help address some of these very complex challenges. Thank you. Whatever you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here. And uh, Michael, uh, Ambassador Donald, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I think it's uh, it's great to be back here. I was here roughly two years ago. 
and it was very different circumstances back then. Uh, and I think we had, uh, you know, a very different exchange uh, when when I had the pleasure to to address you in, in two years ago. Um, it was September 2021. It was it was a month before before the coup in Sudan. We were still very hopeful on the transition in Sudan. We were still working with uh, Prime Minister Hamdok to move, you know, uh, to a completion of uh, of the civilian transition. Uh, and now, you know, two years later, and I will come to this. Of course, we we are in the most devastating, uh, brutal war uh, on the continent. Um, I think Ireland back then was uh, in its first year. Uh, where's Brian? Um, <laughs> in its first year of a very successful uh, UN Security Council tenure, and we've been working there together on on Somalia and other issues. But of course, uh, you know, your focus was on 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 the war in Ethiopia as well. Um, but again, during my address back then, I focused on the themes of transition. Transition was really the, the core topic, the need to support these transitions, the political transition in Sudan uh, to come to an end of the war in Ethiopia. That was, the, you know, the most, back then, it was the most devastating war uh, on the continent and, you know, trying to get the positive trajectory and, and getting to this end, I think, uh, was, was still very far away uh, two years ago. In the short time since then, it's, it's two years, um, the region has witnessed tremendous and profound changes. And it's clear, uh, you know, from where we where we talk no, right now, that there are moments that we can that we can look back and learn, but that there are moments that feel like we have lost them and we have lost the, the positive momentum on the transitions. And uh, we are in, we're stuck again in a very volatile situation of more and more complex problems piling up. We have, of course, the war in Sudan, uh, we have, you know, the the potential conflict um, that is culminating uh, bit, uh, on, on the basis of a potential MOU between Ethiopia and Somaliland. Um, and yes, we have a transition in in Ethiopia. We are out. Uh, Ethiopia is out of the war, but of course, it's a shaky transition. And let me give you a bit of the context of what I'd like to to talk about today: the overview of the present situation in the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea. As you know, EU is going to have an operation uh, for freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. So also the, the bridge and the divider between the Horn of Africa and its, uh, its neighborhood in, in the Gulf is, is boiling, is heating up. And it's, uh, it's also showing us how very close this Horn of Africa is, is you know, to us as our neighbor, but of course also very connected uh, in, in terms of our need for, uh, for trade, you know, 24% of our trade to Asia go through the Red Sea, uh, you know, energy diversification. We need the Red Sea more and more, not just for the oil coming through from the Gulf, but LNG tanks and and, uh, and the like. So it's becoming more and more a close connector, not just between the Red Sea, uh, not just between the Horn of Africa and, and the Gulf, but also for us. The challenges, I think, is, uh, you know, I've already spoken about, um, what are the implications for peace? And I think this is, of course, our job uh, is not just to analyze the conflicts, but is also how do you get from the current conflicts to, to potential mediation and, uh, and to potential settling of conflicts. And I think what we see right now, when I compare it to, to the situation in Northern Ethiopia, we see a plethora of initiatives. We see a, a huge fragmentation of mediation efforts. And of course, the question is, how do you coordinate? How do you bring these efforts together rather than how do you put uh, you know, one effort uh, in the move? And I think this is also very different than two years ago. And then of course, the way forward and that I, I keep to the, to the last, um, because I think the, the picture right now is very gloomy. It's, it's not indeed a, a very positive picture, but I think there is, there is potential. The region is, has huge potential, not just because the region is rich enough to feed itself, but the, the possibility of the region in terms of keeping channels of communication open, in, in terms of having the ability to have cross-border exchange trade, to have cross-border engagement, this, this, you know, this is rich in the region. The region is also rich in its capacity uh, for, for, multi, you know, for, for, multi, um, for an engagement in, in multilateralism that is very different, for example, to, to the Gulf region. The, the Horn is known to, you know, they have EGAD, they have produced EGAD, they know how to do multilateralism, but are we using it? Are we engaging on this? Um, but let me come back to really just paint a bit, a bit of a picture of the situation in the Horn of Africa today, compared to when we last, not all of us, but when we were last together, a little over two years ago, I think um, 
you know, as, as I said, Ethiopia was being consumed um, by a devastating war in, North in, in, in the north in Tigray. Sudan was still on a very welcoming, very optimistic track of, you know, it can be done. You can overrule a dictatorship. You can have a civilian, uh, civilian led transition. You can even have an engagement with the military and you can start doing trust building. And I was just uh, over lunch started to talking about, I was there in Khartoum two days before the war started talking to Burhan, talking to Hameti, you know, about the potential, about the potential of an integrated army, what the army could do if it can be professionalized, looking at the army of Ethiopia and other armies in the region, what this, you know, United uh, Sudanese army could do also in terms of building trust to its, uh, to its citizens. Uh, and now, you know, two years later, we're in a very, very different situation. And I think in Somalia two years ago, political and constitutional crisis risked a serious internal conflict. And of course, uh, Al-Shabaab was uh, present then, in, as it is present right now. South Sudan, we sometimes forget about South Sudan when, it, when we talk about the Horn of Africa. But again, South Sudan was in a difficult situation two years ago. It has not changed. Um, the global situation, I think, was a very different one. It was before, um, you know, it was before the, the war, Russian war of aggression. It was before the war in Gaza. We had a very different pos positioning of uh, multipolarity. It was not a reality. Um, the BRICS assessment, uh, the, the you know, ascension to BRICS for, for some of the countries in the Horn, as well as uh, the Gulf countries, was far away. So I think we had a very different uh, composition of, uh, of the global world um, situation. Now, of course, you know, the, the, the Horn is not, of course, the only region that is in a, in a difficult moment. Um, if we look at Sudan, if we look at the region you know, besides the, the overarching problems of food crisis, of, um, of climate change, of, uh, you know, the, the political environment that is heated up by inflation, that is heated up by critical and very difficult economic uh, situations in all countries, not just across the Horn, but mainly across the Horn. If we, if we, if we take the overarching uh, challenges, let's go into the more detailed um, situations in, in the countries. In Sudan, the war broke out, you know, last year, uh, basically around now in April, fifteenth uh, of April, and it was it was prepared for. I think it was very clear. You could, you know, you could go to Khartoum. It was clear. It's uh, you know, it's militarized. Every corner had its uh, technicals. It was clear that the two sides were less and less interested in talking to each other. Burhan blamed Hemeti. Hemeti blamed, blamed Burhan. But I think we were still hopeful that there is the chance to get back to, you know, getting back from the coup, getting back into a, tra a civilian transition. That was clearly not uh, the idea of the two belligerents. And uh, I think what we've seen, of course, since then, you know, Sudan uh, armed forces and, and uh, the rapid support forces of Hameti, the two sides of the same coin of the coup um, started to fight each other. And it's a relentless war. And I think, you know, just two days ago, we've heard the announcement by Burhan, and the same goes for, for Hameti, that even humanitarian aid, even access for humanitarian aid, they won't allow. Because if it's getting to the places that are, that are controlled, or to the population uh, in places that is controlled by the other side, they will not allow this, this kind of humanitarian access. And you see, 11 million people in Sudan being displaced. I mean, it's the highest number of displaced population worldwide. We know a hunger crisis is coming. It's coming uh, in April, May. Um, but the two belligerents are not ready to, to discuss uh, humanitarian access. They're not ready to give uh, you know, a chance to COH, to a cessation of hostility. They're not ready to even start negotiating ceasefire. <clears throat> However, both sides are saying, you know, in principle, they're ready. However, the the preconditions uh, for this for these kind of ceasefires are so tremendous, or basically, the the preconditions are the other side needs to stop, and and then we can talk about a ceasefire. So we we know we're um, near a ceasefire. Meanwhile, the the population is suffering. The neighboring countries are affected, and I think if you look at Sudan, you know, we do not look at a country that can be, or a conflict that can be contained. We look at a conflict that is already connecting the Sahel to the Red Sea, that is already connecting Libya to further south uh, in the Horn of Africa, that is connecting, that is bringing fighters from the Sahel 
up to 45,000 fighters from the Sahel into Sudan. That is connecting the Red Sea, heating up the Red Sea in a way where we know the, the current um, foreign minister is, was in Tehran last week, reaching out to Iran in a very heated situation where we have uh, the war in you know, Gaza and Israel, uh, where we know both sides are working with Russia. So even for us from, you know, from uh, the neighboring uh, Europeans, this conflict is already a regional conflict that implicates the region in terms of uh, the, the people moving to the neighboring uh, countries. But of course, it's also a conflict that already has direct uh, implications to, to the politics of the neighboring countries. Looking into Eritrea, for example, we know that Eritrea is you know, helping some of the, the some of the armed uh, groups uh, training their 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 people. We know that uh, Hemeti's forces are reaching out into the Sahel, into Central African Republic. We know that the conflict is implicating the situation in South Sudan. Now, South Sudan, of course, being very volatile itself, cannot add another conflict layer um, where we know that you know the movement of RSF towards the oil fields are putting this additional layer of conflict into, into the neighboring country. And of course, we also have an understanding that th there are countries very closely connected to the two sides of the belligerent sites, trying to help their side to win the war. So we have a conflict situation um, where both sides are still hoping that they can win militarily. Where my assessment, our assessment is, even if they can win militarily, it's not the end of the war. It's far from the end of the war. Even if RSF could push through to Port Sudan, it's not the beginning of a new Sudan. It's uh, it's the beginning of a new uh, phase of a war. And I think this is really where all of these initiatives that we see right now working on Sudan. You know, we had Jeddah, where the where Saudis and the Americans were working together. We just had um, an initiative initiative in Bahrain where basically the same composition with the, the two sides who, are, who have maybe more influence or leverage on, on the two belligerents, the Egyptians and the Emiratis were part of the uh, initiative. We have uh, the African Union, of course, we have EGAT, we have an EGAT plus uh, engagement. We had the neighboring um, states engagement by the, by the Egyptians. So we have a lot of actors and I think everyone is doing the right thing, but we need to bring these actors together. And I think that's really the challenge we, we face right now, because what it allows for the two belligerents is to go forum shopping, to do, you know, to go the forum, to the forum that they most like, that they feel is, uh, is, is more sympathetic to their cause. Um, but of course that cannot bring a solution. And we need this solution, not just because of the suffering of the people of Sudan, but also for the stability of, of the region. The region cannot allow Sudan to disintegrate. And I think when we're looking into different scenarios, we're looking at scenarios, you know, ranging from a Libya scenarios, scenario where we have a split of Sudan, where basically the East and the North will stay with Saf and uh, the West, and we don't know about Kordofan, uh, but the West and, and part of Khartoum will stay with RSF. But maybe the more likely scenario would be a Somalia scenario, where you have a lot of pockets of warlord rule, um, because the question of, you know, is the leadership of RSF, is the leadership of, of SAF really in control of each and every field commander? Um, do they really have control of each and every pocket of Sudan? Is there actually a territorial control? I think that's a, that's a very big question. As EU, of course, we very much engaged also in keeping the momentum for the for the civilians to us it has been since the revolution in 2018 extremely important to support the civilian front as in in our understanding it's also important to reflect that sudan is you know as most of our countries uh, has a very wide and rich political landscape it's not just one group it's many groups it's uh, it's many political aspects that are reflected in the political uh, landscape of sudan and how do you bring these groups together? Because of course, you know, you would you would sometimes think a war brings people together and you would agree on one point that is to end the war, but that's not true in, in no country in the world. Of course, the, the political landscape, you know, keeps, uh, keeps fragmenting more and more, but I think we, there is, there is momentum. Uh, and I think this is also, you know, due to the support of, of member states, Ireland, other countries, supporting track two initiatives, supporting small groups to, to start talking to each other, so supporting, let's say, the resistance committees, 
helping to distribute humanitarian aid, but also the resistance committees being part of a landscape and having a voice, supporting women's groups, supporting, I mean, you know, various groups from various regions in Sudan to at least start talking about how do you get to that next stage. You don't need to agree on the political you know, future of your country. You can have very different political views on, on how you want to, to run this country. I think we all have this. We all have, if we like it or not, uh, more or less coalition governments where you have to talk and, and work with your adversaries. But I think this is something where I'm, I see a bit more, let's see, uh, let's say, I see a bit more light at the end of the tunnel. I think there is, and this is, you know, it's a wonderful political culture in Sudan. Everyone has, a political opinion. Everyone speaks about politics. It's it's a very rich culture. It's not a silent culture. And I think this gives hope that people can find a way through communication, through, you know, discussing, even if they don't agree, but it's it's keeping the discussion, it's keeping the channels of communication open. Very different picture, of course, in Ethiopia. That's a very different culture of communication. It's a very different political culture. I think, yes, on the positive side, we have the secession of hostility is holding. There is no war at least not in uh, between Tigray and the center. But of course, there are conflicts. There is a contestation of state, and that's an ongoing contestation. It's it's not, you know, after the war uh, has ended with a cessation of hostility agreement, it's not, uh, you know, that the center is gravitating, that the center is holding. You have a lot of contest contestation from the Oromia uh, region. You have contestation in the Amhara region. And what we see the center trying to do is basically balancing all this... Um, all these regions uh, and trying sometimes to play them against each other, sometimes to consolidate. And I think that's you know that's a bit of the 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 big the big challenge we see in Ethiopia. Um, and of course, we see Ethiopia a very you know powerful country in the region. We don't see Ethiopia and Egypt getting along. We don't see the bridges built on the GERD. We are. We have been quite surprised, let's say, about uh, the announcement of Prime Minister Abiy about uh, access to the to the sea or the right of access to the sea. And I think this is where you know a bit of the critical uh, engagement comes in right now on the on the MOU that so far no one really has seen, but the MOU that would entail an agreement between Ethiopia and uh, Somaliland. Uh, on uh, on access to Berbera Port as in commercial interest, but also to build. Um, uh, a naval base, and talking to the Ethiopian authorities, but also talking to the to the president in Somalia. What I see there is um, is a potential actually for uh, you know for for the Somalis to to take a to take a leap and say, okay, what is it we need to 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 reach in the coming years? What kind of agreements on commercial interests? Do I, as a president of, Mogadish, uh, of, of Somalia, as, as a president in Mogadishu, need to agree with, with my federal member states, including with Somaliland? And I think this is a discussion I would hope that this can happen fairly soon without this MOU leading into another crisis that could culminate into another conflict. Um, I think it would also take uh, you know, the Ethiopians to understand that having, uh, having an agreement with Somalia, you would need to include Mogadishu. You cannot just sign a deal uh, with the federal member states or with Somaliland. But I think it's possible to find to find an overlapping interest where everyone can benefit. Um, I think the question of a naval presence on security is a bigger question. I believe this is this requires much more of a discussion in the region. I would hope that EGAT could lead on this discussion. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you cannot just sleep on it and then hope it's not going to happen. But I think it also needs a discussion. How does the region see itself as, you know, interconnected, not just in terms of regional economic integration, but also as a region that could build a joint regional security ar architecture? And this is, you know, this is for once, of course, the question of uh, access to the sea, but even more importantly, and, and you know, immediately, what is the regional answer to uh, to the to a post atmos scenario in Somalia? Because we know that there will be, you know, the facing out of atmos in Somalia. What is the region's idea? Because the region will be affected. Somalia will be affected, of course, continuously affected by Al Shabaab. But the region will will be affected, um, you know, by by a breaching out of Al Shabaab. What is the regional idea to have a regional security architecture that can bring the region 
into an engagement, but with a close in a close coordination with the Somalis. If this is with assessed contributions through the UN, if this is you know purely AU, if this is EGAD, that should be up to the region. But the region needs to have um, a coordination mechanism to really come to this kind of conclusion. So because now today it's Somalia, tomorrow it might be a different country where you have a conflict in this region. And you need we need the region to to have reactive mechanisms that are you know that are bringing the region rather together than than fragmenting and 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 putting uh, the regional governments apart. So I think this is really where I would see a potential actually uh, you know on the basis of of what we see at the moment, even if it, if it's uh, if it's a critical uh, phase on the MOU, if it's critical phase phase on the facing out of Atmos, but it should be a potential for the region to really come together and. And have this and have this conversation. I think um, you know to 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 step a, a bit back, looking at the Red Sea, but looking at the at the broader question of um, geopolitics in the region. We see, of course, the BRICS, for example, becoming uh, becoming a reality of multipolarity. It's it's a reality for for Ethiopia. It's a reality for for the Gulf states, for UAE and uh, and the Saudis. It's a reality for many countries and specifically for Ethiopia playing, you know, not playing, but engaging with different actors that um, we have not yet fully understood how we should integrate this, this reality of multipolarity in our engagement with the region. I think we're still very good in, you know, support for the African Union. We're very clear in our support for EGAT. But the question is, is that going to be enough? Uh, we see the Gulf states moving very bilateral, very transactional. I don't think that's our DNA. I don't think we should try to compete on this. Um, but how can we convincingly be better in coordinating you know, on, on multilateralism, on multilateral engagements, uh, on a long term, on a medium term, but of course also in, in a reactive uh, short term mode. And I think this is where I would like to end on a, maybe a positive outlook, um, the potential that we see in the region is a potential that I think and hope that we already support with the Horn of Africa Initiative as part of our um, global gateway focus on, on the Horn of Africa. The Horn of Africa Initiative brings together all the finance ministers of the region, including Eritrea, which is you know, different to all other multilateral uh, engagements in, in the region. And it brings them together in, in an attempt to see what does the region look at when they look at connectivity? What do they prioritize? What kind of infrastructure do they prioritize? And by infrastructure, I do not just mean you know, roads and, and trains. I mean, that's where the Chinese are much better at the moment, uh, but where we should also think much more connected. But it's also connectivity in terms of energy connectivity, where it's, you know, it's, it's internet. It's, it's all of the things that we see as where we have strength, where the region has a lot of potential. If you look at, you know, the mobility uh, and the, for example, the, the the internet connectivity in Kenya. I'm based in Kenya. The internet works much better in Kenya than in parts of Germany. I mean, you know, you have you have mobile banking in Kenya that you were dreaming of uh, five years ago in Germany, and you still dream of in Germany. So it's it, the region has a lot of potential. It has potential also to mitigate, let's say, parts of the shocks that we see coming on climate change, because the region has the potential to feed itself if there would be a better connectivity of you know getting the goods from the producers to the markets from the markets to the consumers what we see in the region right now is the region is producing it's uh, extracted to you know other regions like the gulf uh, for their food and fodder security and i'm not saying that shouldn't work that of course you need you need uh, you need cash you need money so you 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 need to continue this but I think the region could be much better if it has a circular understanding of getting the region working for itself, including, for example, fertilizer. Eritrea has fertilizer. It's exporting the fertilizer to China. The region needs fertilizer. As you know, since the war of aggression, Russia and, and Ukraine, fertilizer is exorbitantly expensive. So it's almost impossible for the region to buy enough. So having a much more regional integration, I think, would be, you know, would be helping the region in the true spirit of our EU DNA. This is how we build, you know, trust uh, where there was, you know, no trust politically, but we started to build trust on economic integration. I think this is really something we can be better, we can be stronger, and hopefully, um, you know, this can also lead to, to a more integrated region. 
And if you have a more integrated region, I think this is what we know from, from our own experience, the tendency to go to war against each other if you have you know everything connected your economy your 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 thinking your your trade your your people is is much harder than than doing it when you disconnect it so i think that's really ending on a positive momentum um, but thank you so much and i'm really looking forward to to the discussion thank you Thank you very, very much, Dr. Weber. You've given us a huge amount to, to reflect on a uh, fascinating presentation. Um, as you know, the region is an extremely important um, region for, for Ireland, uh, both the government, but also um, uh, our civil society. Uh, we, we, we have a certain presence in the area and um, uh, the countries which with which you are uh, grappling are ones which mean a lot to us in terms of uh, Ireland's own engagement with Africa generally. Um, let me now open the floor for for questions. Can I begin with just one of one of my own? What, how would you assess the immediate impact of the Gaza crisis? I mean, uh, do you notice in the Horn um, a sort of a, a rise in militant? Um, activism or warnings. Uh, I, I, I was struck by the um, remark by Al-Shabaab recently where they, in effect, wanted to have complete solidarity, if not unity, with, with Hamas. I mean, how do you, uh, how are you experiencing the, the, the Gaza crisis in its immediate impact here? I think that's, you know, that's maybe the most obvious uh, impact. I think uh, it took Al-Shabaab two days to respond with a four-page letter to Hamas. Uh, that was quite surprising because Al Shabaab normally doesn't send four page letters in such a short time frame on, on solid solidarity. But of course, they knew how to write that wave. And it was clear that, you know, I mean, you, you don't know that, I mean, Al Shabaab so far has not really done anything for the Palestinians. But of course, they use that um, right now. How far this is really actually an issue for Somalis? Is, is a bit lost to me because, of course, the Somali population will be pro-Palestinian. There is no difference before exactly. the war or, or now. So they're not changing the, the, the general uh, support or, you know, the, 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 the situation. However, what I think what we see coming right now is we what is observed um, is that there is a heightened trafficking between the Houthis and Yemen and Al-Shabaab. So there is more <laughs> weapons going across the Red Sea. Mm. Um, we don't know how far this goes beyond weapons or, you know, if there is an exchange, that's, I, I, I do not have the, the information, but I think that's, uh, you know, that's a likely next step. Of course, we see a potential risk of Iran coming into the Red Sea. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned the, the Sudanese foreign minister traveling to Tehran, not, uh, you know, not to, not to shake hands uh, there, but to get weapons. Um, now we know that there's a spy, a, an Iranian spy ship docking off the shore of, uh, of Djibouti. That, of course, is of huge concern. Uh, the expectation by the Americans in Djibouti is that this spy ship is helping the Houthis to to find their their targets uh, for the attacks. So, if if the Iranian issue would move further up the Red Sea, closer to to the coast of Israel, Eilat, and and other places. Um, for example, in you know, by docking into uh, the port, Sud port of Su uh, Port Sudan, that would be a serious red flag. It's not yet there, but I think uh, one cannot overlook you know what's boiling up uh, and the risks. And I think the risks are, are really increasing. Thank you very much for that. We have a question from uh, Brigadier General Jera Hearn, uh, who well, is a former commander of the EU military training mission for Somalia in in Mogadishu. Um, Jerry recall, recalls that uh, since 2007, the EU has paid um, just under 3 billion euros to fund the deployment of AU soldiers in Somalia. In fact, that's the full cost. The current force is due to withdraw completely by December of this year. Two connected questions. Has the EU had value for money for this uh, 2.8 billion euros in operational outputs by the AU forces? And who will fill the security void when uh, ATMIS withdraws? Good question. I mean, you know, value for money is hard to judge. I mean, yes, we we are all there. We can all operate in Somalia. Our mission, I mean, our, our embassy is there. Um, the Somali government can operate from Mogadishu. 
that's part of value for money. I don't know, you know, how, how to how to operationalize value for money in this. I think um, it has been clear, you know, for the for the majority of EU member states, let's say six seven years ago, there was a, there was a beginning of a bit of a fatigue to just continue with the same. And I think we had a momentum at the beginning of uh, of the current government of uh, of uh, Hassan Sheikh. You know, understanding that there is a more comprehensive understanding of how to how to secure Somalia, how to have a political alignment, go for you know for the outstanding issues of the constitution, realign and and unify basically the the, the relationship between FGS and FMS. So I think that was a more optimistic um, approach from our side, supported by our side thinking, and we had a joint uh, roadmap basically for for policy for Somalia. And part of the roadmap, so it's a political, economic, but also security roadmap. And we made it very clear last year in May, together with the Somalis, we need to see a transition. We need to see a transition plan that is a realistic transition plan where we need to have an understanding how far are the Somalis ready to go in leading the Somali security, not just in terms of capacity of SNA and police, but also in terms of you know, do they have uh, do they have the political will? Can they move basically clan across clan borders? We need realism here because it's clear um, the Atmis mission as it exists right now will phase out by the end of the year. We don't want to end in a void. Um, we need to have now a very constructive and swift engagement on what could be a follow up mission. Our hope is we we could have a follow up mission that is a totally different mission that would be a mission financed by assessed contributions, where and this is becoming a bit complicated, but where we would hope the AU could you know chip in uh, up to five percent. We would we would cover something and then seventy five percent would be covered by the contributions to the UN. Now assessed contributions that would require a totally new mission. That mission, in our understanding would be a mission supporting the Somali security sector, um, being, you know, protecting uh, critical infrastructure, cr protecting Villa Somalia, protecting the airport, but protecting more in a protective uh, engagement rather than in the kinetic outfit that we see right now that is maybe also not fully used. So we, but we need to have this transition plan. We need to start discussing it. We need to start discussing realist financing uh, opportunities and, and possibilities, because I don't see under the current circumstances EU member states being ready to just continue, um, you know, what we've what we've uh, what we've done so far. Because as you said, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a different it's a different ball game. But Somalia is the second after Ukraine that EU invests in in uh, in, in in including or specifically on on the on the security side. Seventeen years. Uh, it was basically the EU financing Atmis. Um, we do want to work and continue working with the Somalis on the security, but we want the Somalis to take a lead because at the end of the day, it has to be a Somali-led security. It cannot come from outside. But what I said before, I think this is where it's important for the region to also have an understanding what are the region, what is the region ready you know, to communicate, to engage, to, to bring also in terms of troops, to the fore in, in having a conversation about a regional engagement to protect Somalia. That is also important for, for us to, to hear. Um, you talked earlier about the humanitarian crisis, which is threatening to, to engulf the region and the, the hunger crisis in particular will hit by, by May. Um, there's a question here from Sudanya Maitra. Um, uh, in the wake of the conflict in Ukraine and the situation in Gaza, what steps, if any, have you had to take to to fight for policy space, as it were, in in order to highlight this humanitarian challenge? I mean, obviously, uh, there's almost there's potentially going to be donor fatigue in a way. Uh, how do you keep the attention firmly on the humanitarian plight of of the Horn? It's becoming more and more difficult, and I think you know you see this in the big frustration of Ocha of Echo of all the humanitarians right now. I mean, it's underfunded. It's not even forty percent. Um, funded, and we talk about immediate humanitarian uh, engagement. We're not even talking about reconstruction. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned it before, when we talk about, for example, the figures, what would be necessary to reconstruct northern Ethiopia, Tigray, we're talking about billions. 
no one has these billions right now. And, you know, this is really, it's, it's, uh, it's such a disservice to the people who, who've been suffering through the war, who need to come back to normality. Um, and but the question is, is, is a very real question. It's becoming more and more difficult to get humanitarian funding. It's easier actually to get funding for investment, for example, in the Horn of Africa initiative, because that is something, you know, you can build on it, something positive. So the spin is easier than the funding on, on humanitarian. That shouldn't be the case. I mean, people who are suffering from a war shouldn't suffer because we are fatigued, but that's that's massively a real, reality. We see this everywhere. And of course, we see it also in, in the case of Sudan and, and the Horn of Africa in, in general. It will increase even more if we add, you know, to the conflict-related uh, hunger, if we add climate-related. Um, so I think we really need to have much bigger discussions about what does it take to keep regions secure? What does it take to keep people, you know, alive, um, rather than just, you know, the, the funding cycles that are getting less and less and less. So we need we need to have more robust uh, discussions on that. Any questions in the room? Yes, please. My name is Maurice. Uh, I'm one of the Sudanese community in Ireland. Uh, my family is personally affected. My brother and sister ended up as refugees in Uganda right now. I just want to bring back to the rule of the EU in the current disaster uh, that's been inflicted on Sudan. Um, Dr. Weber talked about the expansion of the RSF militia in the region, but the first step which marked the transformation of Hamidis militia from a local militia operating under the Sudan regime to a trans transnational uh, mercenary group was actually the implementation implementation of the 1.2 billion euro EU immigration policy, the so-called Khartoum process. Despite multiple warnings from think tanks, the South London University, the like of Oxfam, uh, Amnesty International, multiple activists, they warn that this policy doesn't only come at high human cost because it pushes refugees into taking more dangerous routes, but it will strengthen the power of the militia in the region and down the line, it will destabilize the region. And they were absolutely right on the money about that warning. That policy started in 2014, 2015, and now we are seeing the result. The militia is so strong, waging war. It's not a war against the Sudanese army, it's a war against Sudanese people. And it's sadly funded by us Sudanese who are working in Europe, paying tax given to the EU. The EU use it to fund and train. The last one was in February 2022, where Hamidi himself secretly, that, that visit was hidden even from the Italian parliament. He visited Italy and had a deal sanctioned through that uh, by the EU, through the same process. A deal involved training of his troops and provision of drones to his troops. So if Dr. Weber would like to comment on that, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um... There is no money. There has not been any money going through the Khartoum process to Hermeti, and of course there are no, there are actually no existing European drones, and none of nothing is provided to Hermeti. You are right in terms of that there was a full acceptance of the government of Burhan and Hermeti, but that was not coming through the EU. It was an acceptance of a government that was a self installed government by the two being number one and number two uh, before the coup and after the coup. And I think this is, of course, you can criticize that we're dealing with both as uh, that we have been dealing with both and as, as a counterpart to discuss. But there was no money going to Hamati before on the Khartoum process. He was, if you follow his, uh, his, uh, his communication, he was always complaining that he's acting as Frontex, but he's not paid as Frontex. So he had a self, you know, his, he he wanted to see his troops as basically the gatekeeper to Libya, which they were, but there was no Frontex money going to, to Hameti. I think the question right now is, and I totally agree, the, the war is not against Saf. The war is against the people of Sudan. Um, the question right now is, how do you get out of this? You know, you, you need a region that is also having an understanding 
that a takeover of a military win of Hameti is not the end of the war in Sudan. It's not, it's not a consolidation. That that requires the region and beyond to also see that, well, you know, what what if you look at the reception of Hameti in the last couple of months, uh, you know, by by all neighboring countries, including Rwanda and South South Africa, it's he's becoming and this is not just up to him, it's also up to Burhan, because Burhan had him as number two. The two of them wanted to be seen as the legitimate leaders of the country. As EU, we have stopped all money after the coup, and we constantly, I was interacting with them, but we were always clear, you're not the legitimate leaders of this country, you were your coup leaders, but you're not leading this country, you're not elected, you're not elected by the people, you disrupted the civilian transition that started in 2019. So the EU had stopped, and of course, many Sudanese were very bitter about this, that we have stopped. You, you can talk to you know, Jibril um, Ibrahim and others. We have stopped every all the money that was going in through the government. We had continued with the develop, development cooperation, but there was no money going to neither Burhan nor Hameti, nor to, to the finance ministry. So. I think you're right in terms of uh, there is much too too much acceptance of the two as leaders as legitimate leaders that has been the case. Um, but let's move on to please yes you ask for the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Webb, uh, for your presentation and it's very extensively talking about the Horn of Africa. My name is Suleiman Abdullahi. I am Somali uh, origin, live here in, in the island for the last 18 years, like nearly 20 years now. Um, and I'm watching it as what happened in that country. And the question I want to ask you is that the European Union uh, initiative of the Horn of Africa, how extended, how long you... I think the, the situation, how you think this high risk, the, the, the decision made by the Abiy Ahmed to have access for the Red Sea and agreeing with the one particular um, uh, region in Somalia, which is the, and the Somali sovereignty is one at risk, number one. And, and that impact how the Al-Shabaab can get the recruit for the young Somali brainwashing them and say like, we are defending the national, they come up with the nationalism. So I was looking for this morning, say like they got over a thousand young men and some of the boats and uh, defected from other side, uh, like a government side or Somali, like a nationalistic to now showing their radical. So what are the, how can we prevent it that Al-Shabaab Al not get this time to decision time where you saying that the Atmos uh, peacekeeping force will leave in Somalia at the end of the year, and then the Ethiopian initiative come through uh, through Somaliland regionally. Mm. How volatile that is? That's one question. The second question is the Emirates' influence in the region, in Ethiopia, in Somalia, in Sudan. And is that deregulated uh, or that they have no any kind of a free ride for, for the whole region and how that uh, pos positive or negative in the opinion of the European Union. Thank you. If I can start with the second question, because I think it's, it's you know, it's quite, uh, quite obvious that the, that the reach of the, of the UAE in, in the Horn of Africa is, is growing. I mean, the footprint is, is massive. Um, and there, there is a lot of influence, and I think there is a lot of influence uh, that is also positively perceived by the leadership of the countries because they do sometimes prefer very bilateral transactional engagements. This is much more what the UAE does than in comparison to the EU. And we're not transactional, we're not so quick, we don't do we'd rather do multilateral than than bilateral. So I think many, many leaders in the region prefer. Uh, the Emirates style, let's say. Um, what does that result into? I think that's a different question. But it's also a question that needs to be discussed with the leadership in the region. Um, I think on, you know, on we have overlap on interests with the with the Emiratis in in terms of climate change prevention. We have we have overlaps in investment in in green energy. Um, but for example, we don't have necessarily an overlap in 
in what we would like to see, oh, sorry, in, in, in the political future of Sudan. For us, it's very important that it's a civilian-led government. Um, maybe that's not the same necessarily for the Emirates, but I think to me, the question of the Emirati footprint is much more a question of, you know, is that is that um, is that an engagement that is much more appreciated in the region because of their style of doing politics than our engagement? Um, so it's I would like to bring the question back to to the leadership in the region. Um, the MOU that you mentioned before and the, you know the the mobilization of of Al Shabaab, I think this is really worrying right now. Of course, I mean we see Al Shabaab being being strong. Um, mobilizing on the background of, uh, of you know, fighting against the, the Ethiopians, um, that will that will not just bring more problems to the current leadership in Somalia, but but also of course more problems to the region, um, because if if Al Shabaab is reaching out, if they if they reach out, you know, as they have done in in Kenya before and, and now increasingly potentially also in in Ethiopia, it's um, it's a force you can hardly stop right now. Um, so yes, it's a problem. I think what I said in the beginning, you know, I would I would hope that there can be a solution where basically uh, President Hassan Sheikh can can play a proactive role in shaping uh, shaping negotiation on, for example, uh, you know, commercial interests. Um, and I think that could be a solution that can bring the you know the the the, the tensions down. Uh, if that's not possible, I mean, I think an, another conflict in this region would really be not just devastating, but it would be a total destruction for what has been slowly, slowly, slowly rebuilt in Somalia, but of course also in in the neighboring countries. So I I really hope that there is enough wisdom to prevent uh, a, a, you know an eruption of war. Um, but yes, I think the risk, as you laid out, is is clearly yeah, there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Adekunle Gomez. I'm from uh, Ghana in West Africa. So like everybody else, I'll probably be looking at the Horn of Africa uh, as an outsider. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation because you finished, as you said, on something uh, positive. Now, uh, my uh, well, I've also taken an interest in the Horn of Africa, as I say, especially Somalia. And uh, uh, last year, um, for example, uh, sorry, no, uh, um, the there's a um, the rule of uh, from what you said, it looks like you are um, uh, the EU is dealing with uh, the governments. Now, people usually ask when uh, something happens in a country, what are the people themselves uh, doing to resolve it? Now, uh, forty years ago, last year, uh, I came across. Uh, uh, the work of, uh, uh, sorry, not, not uh, 40 years ago, but last year I came across information that uh, uh, the late Dr. Howard Abdi established a Hope Village 40 years ago. Now, uh, 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 one of the programs is the reconciliation, uh, uh, peace and recon reconciliation, conflict resolution. Now, another information I came across is the Somali Institute for Peace. So my uh, first question is, uh, uh, does the EU deal with only um, at official level or uh, the role of civil society, uh, uh, do, uh, whether they deal with society? Then the second question is, uh, when you made reference to the humanitarian uh, situation, now, uh, yes, um, we see, uh, we hear and see news of uh, the food situation. At the same time, you go to a supermarket in Europe and you see food from the Horn of Africa. Now, people have different uh, you know, uh, uh, views about that. But my question is that, uh, are there efforts even to put that on the agenda? So for example, if you take Kenya, to ask them, why is food going out of the country when people are starving? Thank you. Let me start maybe with the, with the beginning, because of course, I mean, I think member states, Ireland, and you can, you know, you can speak uh, for Ireland. I think most of us focus much more on civil society and supporting civil society than than just focusing on on states. And I think, you know, the the peace uh, organizations, the the reconciliation organizations in Somalia, but also in Sudan, and other places. Uh, the I, I spoke about the the civilians in Sudan that we support. You know, to to basically come together because we we do strongly believe that they should build the government. Um, 
coming from from civil society organizations, you know. So, so I think this is where the EU is is maybe the strongest supporter. Uh, do we always put our flag on it? No. Um, should we do this? I think that's a discussion we are, we are currently having. No. So absolutely not just focusing on 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 governments as such. Uh, there is a lot of engagement on civil society and and massive support for civil society because we see that in our own countries. Of course, you know you need an active civil society to to be able to have uh, a strong coherence and and a link between citizens and state and an accountability. Without a civil society. This is lacking, and then you know you don't go far. And I think this is really where um, it's it's not just a token. It's it's really out of uh, being convinced that that civil society is is a core, the core element for for functioning uh, for a functioning country and and relation between state and citizens or government and citizens. Um, maybe the 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 last question. Can you remind me on the last question? Yeah, uh we uh, we uh, saw on the um, uh, in the media about the uh, humanitarian especially uh, oh, food okay, crisis food. Yeah. yeah and at the same time uh, uh, yeah. food from the yeah. horn of africa is uh, uh, being sold in supermarkets here and i was wondering like does it make sense in a way to uh, to appeal to the european public to say give us money to uh, send food, uh, uh, to send food when they go to the supermarkets and they have their own food and um, uh, the question is uh, like can the uh, uh, Kenyan government, for example, not be confronted and ask, why are you sending food out of the country when, uh, uh, well, uh, the media says uh, there is famine? So we just signed a preferential trade agreement with Kenya to do exactly both. Um, and I think this is really important. We want Kenya to sell products, including agricultural products, so they can have cash returns because Kenya needs cash. That doesn't mean that Kenya should only sell to the outside. But if you look at the complexity of a country, you cannot just produce for the for the for the national consumption. You can produce for the national consumption if you have a regionally integrated uh, economy. A country like Germany, for example, we cannot produce our own food. We need we need neighboring countries. We need trade agreements, and I think the same goes for Kenya. But of course, the question is. Are we, you know, is it is it basically the supplies coming in for for the regions in Kenya that are suffering currently from uh, from either drought or, or flooding? That that again is is more the question of of humanitarian aid. Kenya in itself is not food insecure. Kenya can produce food, and Kenya can have food produced in in the region, but of course Kenya can also produce food for the export to, you know, to basically. Uh, Gain the money that they need to invest in in other in in, in you know in industries in investments in in energy uh, that that they choose to invest. So I think it's I'm I'm not an expert on uh, on agricultural trade agreements, but I think this trade agreement for Kenya is is quite positive. But of course, it it really takes the region to be better integrated because otherwise, and you will see this right now, it will have a massive impact. What we see in the in the Red Sea, food prices will go up exponentially because because everyone needs to go around uh, you know the, the the continent including the food exports from Kenya to Europe but of course also the food uh, import from Ukraine grain to um to to the Horn of Africa so it's not a one-sided issue I don't think it's just one aspect but it, it's um it's it's definitely much better if you can produce and consume in your more immediate neighborhood than, than you know, uh, very, very far away. Thank you very much, Adriba. In fact, we've run out of time, unfortunately, and um, we could talk quite some considerable time. You have a gigantic portfolio, really, between <laughs> one thing and another. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody online, everybody in the room for taking part in this event. Most of all, I'd like to thank you for having been good enough to come here to uh, make a fantastic presentation and to answer some challenging questions. We wish you all the best um, back in Nairobi with many challenges that you're, you're, you're facing. And you at least managed to strike a couple of positive notes. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it is, as a, we can all see, it is a, a particularly difficult time in, in, in the region at present. And um, uh, we wish you uh, every success with your efforts on behalf of the EU. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.